good day. My name is Ted Holden. I'd like to visit with you today about using Hampson Russell's Rock SI and Lift OSI applications. We really use interactive rock physics for this reservoir development, and you'll see how it's applied here in this presentation. You know, rock physics is called the interdisciplinary glue combining geophysics, petrophysics, geology, and reservoir engineering. And of course, you see the subcategories surrounding these main topics. First, I'd like to illustrate interactive rock physics using the Rock SI module. In the Rock SI module, there are some basic rock physics model types. Uh, what we see here first is granular models, where we have packs of spheres with interstitial porosity. This is uh, appropriate for modeling high porosity rocks that are unconsolidated and lightly cemented sandstones. Another type of model that can be utilized and already is in place in Rock SI is inclusion models. These are backgrounds and inclusions where the porosity is more like spears, needles, penny cracks. This is uh, typically used for low permeability rocks, very tight consolidated sandstones and carbonates. There are a couple of different basic models in Rock SI, the self-consistent model, differential effective medium models. I might also state at this point that if you have a proprietary model that you like, you can also include that algorithm in the user interface. For each model that we already have in Rock SI, there is a help sheet. And the help sheet will explain about the model. It will have a description, key features, and other information. Here's the sheet for the unconsolidated all sandstone. And you see the cross plot of porosity and P wave velocity. And then you see different packs, grains with different porosities. And you see how they lie on the Roos average. And then you see varying effective porosities as we head up towards the modified boat average. So you can see this is a, a visual interpretation of what we are actually doing in these petroelastic models. In the example for the inclusion model from the help file, we also see description and key features, and we see another cross plot of porosity and P-wave velocity. But in this plot, an important parameter for this type of model is the aspect ratio, and that's the, the height versus the width of the pore space, that ratio. And you can see these various ratios for those very much like pancakes or needles in point A and in B and in C. So you see the lines for various aspect ratios between the roots and the vote bounds. And another important thing that we need to do is take a look at all of our data and we look at it in terms of elastic properties, petrophysics, and seismic waveform. One of the things that we do when we take our well augs is we compute various petrophysical properties like V-clay, porosity, water saturation. And then we can look at our elastic properties like P-velocity, shear velocity, and density. We also create a classification system because what we're going to do is we're going to relate these various classifications of different types of rocks to elastic property cross plots. As a QC, we see the seismic traces. They're in black, and some uh, nearby seismic traces are also illustrated in the min max around that black. That's the input seismic. The red curve is a synthetic generated from the elastic properties that we see here in the well off. So you can see the well tie, and you can see the correlation between synthetic and seismic for various petrophysical effects. I might mention that in the elastic properties list, we have coal shale sand, that's water sand, oil sand, and calcite. And you can see the color coding in those there. The next thing we want to look at is the parameterization in a petroelastic model. So here we have granular type petroelastic model. It's the unconsolidated oil sand. There are a number of different parameters we need to set like critical porosity, the roughness of the grains, the bulk modulus of the quartz, the shear modulus of the quartz, the density of the quartz. And then the same parameters, bulk, shear, moduli, and, and for the shale or the clay. Here's salinity of the formation fluid. 
gas water ratio, the oil API, the uh, gas oil ratio, and the gas gravity. So anytime we're working with a petroelastic model, we need to set those parameters that we need to convert these volumes of minerals and fluids into a model elastic curve for P velocity, shear velocity, and density. So this is the uh, model setup here. As I said before, you could use your own model here. Uh, go ahead and put that algorithm. To do that, you would just click on the advanced button and then fill out the, uh, the page as far as the functions in the sequence that you need. One of the real powerful things about Rock SI is our ability to create a rock physics template and then adjust parameters. I call it tuning the rock physics template. An application where this could be very valuable is if I had a large offshore survey. And in the survey, I had multiple structures. And in one of the structures, I had discovered hydrocarbons. Well, of course, the first thing I'm going to want to do if I have a commercial reservoir in one structure is I'm going to want to know what are the potential for production of hydrocarbons from those other structures that may be 10, 20, 30 kilometers away from my discovery. We know that we can create a petroelastic model in that structure that has a control well. We know that we can move that petroelastic model into those other structures for the same reservoir for which we constructed the petroelastic model in the control well. There's only one problem. In many cases, the structure might be lower or higher, structurally lower or higher. So I need to do some tuning with my petroelastic model so that the template will indicate how the location of the oil sand or the water sand might change based on the new criteria for the new structure that I'm going to investigate. So here we've gone back to the initial condition. And this time, I'm going to make another what-if scenario. I'm going to say that the offsetting structure is actually shallower than the one where we have a well. And our undrilled structure that we need to investigate is at a shallower depth and a lower pore pressure. But at the same time, I want to take a look at the shale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the shale PEM here. Now I have gone to a shallower depth of burial and a lower pore pressure in terms of the petroelastic model parameterization for the oil sand. And you can see that instead of the oil sands being here, or even down here as they would be in a deeper structure, now my expectation would be that they would reside up here in this particular cross plot. But let's look at variance in the shale petroelastic models template in regard to a range of a depth of burial and a range of pore pressure from 1,850 meters to 2,000 and 50 meters with a step in the uh, overlay of 50 meters. Pore pressure ranging from 20 to 23 megapascals with a step of 0.2. You can see that in that particular shale model, they move in concert along the same trend. So what this is telling us is that we would expect shale points in shallower reservoirs, or the shale above the shallower reservoirs, to be up here. And with deeper depth of burial, they're going to exist down here along the same trend line. So it's very important to understand the relative distance, how much breakout we're going to have from the shale trend, say, to the oil sand. And of course, the water sand will be uh, in between the shale trend and, and the oil sand. So we would expect the oil sand to be in this region, the water sand up here, and the shale up here. In the middle reservoir, we would expect our oil sands here where they are because we have well control in this case. The 100% water is here and the shale would be up here. And then in the deeper zone, we would expect our oil sands to be down here our water sands to be in here, and our shales to be up in here. We can really go through those big offshore surveys with multiple structures and only one structure with well control using this technique and more reliably predict the currents of oil or gas 
in those other structures. This is really, really important for a couple of reasons. One, a structure could contain a huge amount of petroleum or gas. And the other important point is we need to minimize our risk by really applying the science that we have as well as we can, as interactively as we can, because many of these wells are $150 million to $200 million to drill. So I encourage everybody with offshore projects to start utilizing these tools in our toolkit to uh, minimize your risk.